So again, hello everyone and welcome back to our LMU Business Insights webinar series. My name is Nola Wanta and I'm the Senior Director of Business Development and Strategy for the College of Business Administration at LMU. As we transition to our post-pandemic life, we hope to provide you insights to lead and to see the world in a new perspective. Our LMU Business Insights webinar series is aligned with our mission to advance knowledge and develop business leaders with moral courage and creative confidence to be a force for good in the Los Angeles and global community. Before we get started, I'd like to uh, go over quickly some of our general webinar guidelines. So um, if not already, please do adjust your screen to speaker view, which is right on the top right-hand corner of your screen. Uh, type your questions in the Q&A window, which is right below um, your screen. These questions will be moderated after the presentation. Also use the chat window to post your insights and comments only, please. And as a friendly reminder, this webinar is being recorded and will be available after the presentation. So with that, we are proud to bring you our fourth installment of our six part marketing injection series hosted by our M School. To introduce today's talk, I'd like to um, pass the baton over to Professor Andy Rome. Thank you, Nola. So after a one week hiatus, we're back. For those of you just tuning in for the first time, this is the fourth installment in our six part series of business injections brought to you by our favorite thinker, creative futurist, Dietmar Dama. Right, Andy. And Whoops, sorry about that. Dietmar has dropped some serious wisdom over the last few weeks, looking way back in history to the times of caveman and lifting the post curtain, the post COVID curtain of the future, giving us a glimpse into a world full of robots. Past talks can be found on the CBA YouTube page. So this week, Dietmar will get us back on track with the second O in the C-O-R-O-N-A series, O for offline goes online. The corona crisis completely shattered our offline way of life. The only thing that remained was our online world. This meant that businesses of all types needed to recreate offline experiences online in order to survive. The session examines why some things worked, why other things didn't. It shows how important it is to rate on online solutions with offline heart. The learning takeaway, the paleo customer loves the online experience, but only if you do it right. Please join us in welcoming literally from the future, well, nine hours ahead in Vienna, Austria, Dietmar Dahmen. Hello, everybody. I am super excited to be back. Fantastic. Thank you very much for the introduction. And let's just jump in quickly. I'm going to share my screen, but I cannot share my screen yet because it's activated. So until it's activated, uh, I just say hi. And I think it's probably possible now. Yes, it is possible. And here we go. So boom, suck. I think you should see everything now. And here we go again. So this is the fourth installment. So let's just recap really quickly what happened so far. Uh, what happened is that it is in the C we discussed that chaos leads to creativity and innovation. We heard about quantum creativity, about binary creativity, and we learned that pain really makes you go and actually implement the creative ideas that you have. We learned that small pain leads to small ideas, whereas big pain leads to big ideas. So pain and chaos is actually something relatively positive. We also learned that most of this innovation in the times of Corona is happening online. And then we learned that everything that is online and based on data can actually be done by robots and automation. In the last session about robots and automation, we learned that the biggest driver for everything is laziness. If we have somebody else to do it for us, we prefer it than having to do it ourselves. We learned that online and automation actually delivers this laziness. And we learned that Corona added safety to the benefits of laziness because we don't have to go to the store anymore in order to buy stuff that's dangerous. And we just learned that actually all kinds of business can be, become a service and deliver their um, services online. So if everything is online, the question is, is offline dead? Is offline dead? If we can get everything online with a click, if we can get everything delivered right to our home, if all this is safe and human contact is dangerous, why 
Would we ever want to consume, shop, or do business any other way? Why should we ever want to leave the home? Why should we get out into a dangerous world where we might have to drive, we might have to fly, we might have to pay to get in, we might have to do all those things? Why should we do that? Well, you learned that at one point, there's a problem zero. And the problem zero is the laziness. So you have to ask, if the laziness is the problem zero, what can fight this problem? What is stronger than laziness? And the only thing that is stronger than laziness is experience. Experience is awesome. We are ready to pay for plane tickets to fly to Paris. We are ready to pay for concerts to see people. Experience is fantastic. Experience is the only thing that is stronger than laziness. And that has been with us forever. Forbes said that experience is replacing the material goods as the most important product of the 21st century. People are willing to spend more money on an experience than on just another t-shirt or another jacket. And this leads us to the fourth installment, the O, because experience and all the drive for experience comes from our offline soul. If you look at yourself and you're a student at LMU, you might think, why is offline important to me? I actually, I am cool. I'm a digital native. I do everything online. And if you think that you're a digital native, that might reflect the materials that you use, the technology that you use, but you are not a digital native from your soul and from the emotional uh, um, makings. You are, in fact, a Stone Age native. We are Stone Age natives. That's what we are. We are paleo humans because our DNA didn't change. Our likes and dislikes didn't change. The things that we crave and love didn't change in the last couple of years or couple of thousand years. Actually, we are paleo humans in the things that we crave for most. And if we are paleo humans, it also means that we are paleo, that you have paleo customers. Online currently might be the surface of service, of getting stuff, of being connected to other people, but offline is the soul. Online might be the wave, but offline is the hug. Offline takes you in your arms and says, yeah, come to the brand, stay with me, I love you. And this is awesome and this is what we want. So what kind of hugs do we like? There's now a couple of things that I want to share with you that did not change in the last 10,000 years. Number one, we want to love. Love is a big, big driver for everything you do. You do crazy things out of love. And we want to love. That's what we do. So you have to give customers a reason to love you. And there's many, many products that do that offline in a perfect way, right? Like you can get the conscious step socks, where then some part of the profit is used for good, like saving dogs or cancer prevention, stuff like that. We know those things. But can you do this also online? And the answer is yes. Of course, you can share love offline, but you can sh also share it online. Actually, I'm doing it. I'm sharing love online because this today is going to be the last time you get a single handout. And from, next, from the next session on, I produced for you a really, really big, amazing extended handout with all six things, with all six uh, installments. And you can download it online and maybe you can even get it offline. We will see. But I, that's a, uh, a, an online and offline installment to uh, help you like what I do, right? And then we want to be loved as consumers. We want to be loved. So you have to give the consumer a feeling and a reason to feel loved. I think the best thing about sticking to somebody and showing the love, in my point of view, was Nike. When everybody left Kaepernick, Nike stayed with him. Nike said, we believe in you. You are our hero. And this is fantastic. And can this be done online? In a slightly different way, it can. In Austria, for instance, where I get my milk, you can take a photo of the milk bottle, and then you can actually see the date of production. You can see the temp tra transport temperature. You can even see the farmer where the milk comes from. And this is kind of a way to show that the milk cares about me, they care about the quality of the milk, and they care where the milk comes from. This, of course, is organic milk. So this is a really nice way to do that. Uh, customers or people also want to be acknowledged. 
Acknowledgement means that if they say something, that you react to that, right? So you have to act on feedback. A fantastic example, in my point of view, is the UK and what McDonald and what the uh, UK McDonald's did. There was a, a lot of customers who said that they want uh, McDonald's to get rid of plastic straws. They read that and they said, you asked, we listened. Paper straws will be rolling out of all our UK restaurants. This was an amazing reaction to customer feedback and to a demand that came from the people that use the brand. Can this be done online? Yes, of course, this was actually an online thing. So obviously it can be done online. It was an interaction of an online request and an offline action. And finally, we want the world to be better. We want our kids to have a better life. We want uh, our products to be better. We want our services to be better. We want to improve things. So you as a manager or you as a brand, you need to improve life. And to me, one of the most beautiful uh, examples of that is Patagonia. Patagonia is now selling used clothing alongside the new cloning. That's clothing. That's an amazing move to keep the planet uh, safe, to actually put recycling in the front and say recycling first. This is as important to recycle as to buy the new stuff. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Can this also be done online? Yes, kind of. Uh, I have actually shares in a company that is called Collect ID. And what we do is we tag uh, jerseys of sports clubs. This is a Swiss one, a Swiss case, when you can actually then scan the jersey and you can interact with the club uh, online via the jersey, which is an amazingly nice thing online. It only works online. So this is a direct path to the online interaction with the club. All these drivers in reality are experiences. Wanting to be loved, you want the experience of love. Wanting to uh, be acknowledged, you want the experience of being acknowledged. Wanting to have a better life, you want to experience that the life actually gets better. So how can you do those things in times of corona? So let's take a deeper look at what experiences actually are. If you see on the bottom uh, right, the roller coaster, you might ask yourself, is this an experience? And the question is, yes, it's an amazing experience. It's a roller coaster. How great is that? And that is already the thing. Is it really great? What kind of experience is it? My kid might find it great. My dad might find it horrible. So the fact that a roller coaster just propels you around might be interesting to some and horrible to others. So what kind of experience this is depends. It depends. We don't know. Experiences, in fact, are very individual. Every experience is individual. You as a single person has the experience. Nobody else has it. No target group has it. Nobody has it, right? No two people have the same experience, says uh, Joseph Pine and James Gilmore in a book that's called The Experience Economy. This book is not very new. It was actually written in times of offline, but still it is very, very important that no two people can have the same experience. It really depends on your mood, who you are with, what kind of situation you are in. It really, really gives a certain flavor of the interpretation of the experience. It can even be that you might like the same thing completely differently in different moods. If you're relaxed, you might like that kind of music. If you're not relaxed and you want energy, you might hate the kind of music. Experiences are very situational and no two people can have the same experiences. Can experiences be done online? Yes, of course, but only kind of, right? Individualization and in Zoom and stuff like that is not really, really as interesting as the individual experience of say a roller coaster. So offline is, superior online tries to mimic offline so off online is the copy but still it kind of works then we go back to the thing and we see two people dancing so we have to ask ourselves is that an experience is it an experience to dance and of course it's an experience to dance right how do we experience it how do you experience dance 
And I think you experience dance full body with the goosebumps. Oh, he or she is touching me with the sweat, with the heart rate, with the temperature. It's a full body experience that you can feel, smell, touch. It's an amazing thing. You experience it with all senses. You hear it, you smell it, you feel it. It is not just a visual thing like my presentation now. It's a full body thing with all senses and you actually feel if the dance is perfect and the experience is great, that the two of you, with an emphasis on you, are the center of the universe. You are the center of the universe. The universe revolves around you. So experience is very personal. It puts you in the center. It's not just individual and different for everybody. It also upgrades your um, your value to yourself. You are in the center of everything. That is why, for instance, 42% of people think that artificial intelligence improves quality of service, but 84% prefer to interact with a human. Because if you are interacting with a human, you feel understood, you feel uh, better service, even if it's not better from a technological point of view, but from an emotional point of view. You feel that you are in the center of the universe. Can this be done online? Again, kind of, right? Uh, there is certain solutions right now, find your best online psychiatrist and stuff like that. But I think uh, it is much better to talk about your problems offline. There's the concert world right there with a Fortnite concert. And of course, Fortnite becomes the COVID concert venue for Gen Z and the millennials, but still it's second best. If you have a choice to either go to an offline concert in the real stadium with thousands of people or look at something on Fortnite, I bet you would choose to go for the real thing and experience it full body with everything you have. The next step is uh, the other people. So we have individuality, person, it's personal, and it's together because experiences are social. So being surrounded by others is very, very important. We want to share our experiences. The more outstanding the experience, the bigger the, sh the drive to share this experience. If you experience something that is really, really monumental, and changes your life and touches your soul, you want to share this. That's why a lot of people share experiences. Actually, 66% share good experiences, 73 actually share bad experiences. This depends on personality, I guess, but a lot more people share bad experience. But anyway, more of half of us want to share experiences, especially if they are big. Can this be done online? Yes, absolutely. And online is even better. Online spreads faster, further, deeper. You can share more faster than in real life. So the social aspect of experience is actually dominated by online. The offline world, the actual physical world of mouth is slower than a digital world of mouth. So if you now compare the worlds offline and online, you would see that the individuality, the personality, the social thing of online and offline is not a separation. We are looking at a plus. It's, pl it's a plus thing. It is actually adding together. I know that this is a branding class, so let's look at the ex effect of experiences on brand decisions. Experiences are things that we want to share. So there's a story element that's on the lower corner. How great is the story? How amazing is it to share it? And then there's a uniqueness. How unique is my story? If you have an amazing story that is very, very unique, you have a very high experience. If your story is really basic and boring and the, unique is also, the uniqueness is also a little bit boring, you have a very basic experience. And this is not only true for experiences, this is also true for brands. If you have a basic brand and basic product like a glass, and there's two glasses, one is 99 cents and the other one is 299. And they all have a very low uh, thing on story and a very uh, low rating on uniqueness, which one would you get? You probably get the cheapest one, right? Why pay 299 when you can get it for 99 cents? So if it's a basic product, the cheapest one wins. But then there's products that have a little bit more uniqueness and that have a little bit more of a story, right? And those are brands. And if you have a branded product and one and the, the, the regular one is 99 cents, but say the Nike one 
is two ninety nine. You go, hey, I want the Nike one. That's much cooler. I'm willing to pay two bucks to be a cool person and have a Nike glass, right? It shows that I'm athletic. It actually uh, reflects my values. That's a great, great thing. So the coolest one wins or the most meaningful one wins. If it's fair trade, anyway, something will win. And then there's like big brands that uh, are beating the price. The price can be bet by, by, by brands. And then there are amazing brands, epic brands like Gucci. And if the Gucci glass is 28 bucks and it's just the same glass, but it says Gucci on it, you go, oh my God, that is so sexy. I cannot believe it. I'm going to go for the Gucci one. That's the most crazy thing. I'm going to show it to my friends and I'm going to show off. And this is really, 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 really amazing. So with Epic Brands, the sexy one wins. And the question is, what tops Epic Brands? Is there any reason why we would pay more than 28 bucks for a glass that is the same one physically? from the body as the 99 cents one, where we only change the soul, where we only change the story. And the answer is yes, of course. And that answer is experience. If you can have this glass of water, for instance, with Ben Affleck and Matt Dillon, that really rocks the story element absolutely out of the park. It really goes high on uniqueness. And you are willing to pay a thousand bucks if those two people bring you this kind of glass. This is an amazing thing. And the experience is the biggest driver of everything we want. 98% of companies say they compete mostly on the basis of customer experience. The product is the same. Maybe there's a little bit more sex. Maybe there's a little bit more story. But if you get experience, there's tons of sexiness, tons of story, tons of uniqueness. That's the thing. And 96% of customers are willing to pay more for a better customer experience. What they want is they want to feel like a kid in the store. They want to feel like this. This is what your customer wants to feel, right? He's not amazed about the, uh, the, 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 the regular things. He says, my God, I've never seen something like this. This is amazing. Everybody who's competing with you has a product. Everybody has a glass. That glass has a certain price. Everybody has a good price. Maybe there's even a service of delivering it at home. But the emotion is on the top of the pyramid. The story power, the uniqueness power, the thing that elevates you up. And that is not just a theory that is actually tested over and over and over again. This is data from the Swiss Marketing Club, and it says that 14% are only affected by the price. This, of course, is in highly developed markets, in markets where people already have enough glasses have enough t-shirts, have enough TV sets and stuff like that. The price then is not really important. It's only 14%. The design, slightly more important. Almost 40, like 41%, already pretty good. Marketing, 43. So here comes the story value. The story value is getting a little bit more important. The story varies, value is then captured by the brand, and that's already 67%. How cool is the brand? The marketing is just the moment the momentary advertising campaign. Now, the brand is the accumulated reservoir of advertising campaigns, of images and stuff like that. And that is much, much stronger. But that is not the top thing. The top things are the company culture and the personal behavior of the people that are servicing you, talking to you when you buy. This is experience-driven commerce. This is what is happening and experience-driven commerce is happening now and it happened 10,000 years ago. Experience is an awesome thing, whether it happened 10,000 years ago or at 10 o'clock Pacific time. The experience is awesome means that the brand that delivers that experience, this by the way is the museum of ice cream is awesome. And if the brand is awesome and the experience is awesome and you are experiencing it, it shows that you are awesome. I am awesome. If you do this, if you get the museum of ice cream experience or the being acknowledged because you have a Gucci glass experience or a Nike water glass experience, you feel good. 
because the experience is and the brand is the mirror in which you see yourself. The experience is the mirror in which I see myself. And not just that, because there's another woman taking the photo. So it is also the mirror in which others see you. How good do you look if you're in the museum of ice cream? How good does it look if you're stepping out of a hammer car that used to be sexy and is now evil because it's completely uh, polluting the planet? It changes, and that's why people ditch the brand. Unless hammer goes electric, nobody will buy a regular combustion engine hammer anymore. So this is the experience universe. It's about how you feel, how others see you, how if you feel loved, if you uh, feel appreciated and stuff like that. And let's look quickly how this experience universe actually works. How does the experience universe works? Of course, it doesn't have planets. It has certain things like data and services and topics and events and things like that. Is it social? How cool is it? And blah, 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 right? And the attraction, how much experiences you have, that is actually the weight of the, those things. If you have heavyweight services, heavyweight topics, heavyweight data, you create a, a gravity towards the experience or towards your brand that attracts a lot of people. So the weight of the experience is your attraction. How much do you have? How heavy is this? And then in, there's gravity, but in space, there's not only gravity, there's also space time. And space time, the space time fabric is the stuff that connects everything. And the success of your brand and your experience depends on the fabric, on the things that uh, you might not even see, but that connects everything. How connected are your services? How connected are your events? How connected to your customers and guests are you? How connected to corporations and other brands are you? This is very, very important. We might not see the fabric. We don't see that we are in space time, just as we don't see that there's air around us and oxygen and all those kinds of things. We might not smell it, we might not feel it, but we really notice the results. If there is a lot of air, you feel good. If there's no air, you die. So if there's a lot of connectivity, it's good. If there's zero connectivity, you die. So every brand needs fabric and weight. Every brand needs online and offline. Every brand needs function and emotion. And how can you deliver that? It's building a universe. If you're a brand manager, you do not manage one single planet. You actually manage a solar system or an entire universe of connectivity. How can you do that? And my tip is very, very simple. Separate first function and emotion. Let's look at the functional side. You just do it in pre-experience. There might be things like inspiration, evaluation, selection, getting ready and stuff like that. Then the experience itself. I always suggest that you try the flywheel model rather than the funnel. In the flywheel, you know that you need to attract, engage, and delight. And who do you need to attract, engage, and delight? Strangers, prospects, customers, promoters. And this is turning over and over and over again. It never stops. With the wheel, one thing leads to the next. And then obviously there's post experience, which is things like rating, sharing, remembering the experience or getting ready for a new one. And the attraction of this comes from the mass of experiences. If you have a lot like Disneyland, a lot of people come to Disneyland because they know there's so much experience. The experience mass is so big, there will be something for me. And Disneyland doesn't attract just uh, offline, but also online because you can share your experience. You can do all those kinds of things. So the experience mass, how much do you generate, attracts people both offline and online when you do it in the store. This is the functionality. In the next five minutes before I'm done, I'm going to talk about the emotional universe. We all know the func functionality, but look at the, look, let's look at the emotion. There's an amazingly good tool that's called the limbic map, 
that helps you understand emotions. The limbic map is the representation of the actual limbic system in your brain. And as you can see on top, there's stuff like adventure and thrill. On the bottom, there's stuff like balance. And what you can do with a system like this, which you will also have in the handout, you can place any brand within that system. Let's say I like fashion, so let's say Louis Vuitton. Where's Louis Vuitton? Is Louis Vuitton more with stimulation or more with balance or more with uh, dominance? In my point of view, Louis Vuitton is here. It's extravagance and creativity. If you wear Louis Vuitton, you show extravagance and creativity. What happens to Rolex? What do you show if you wear Rolex? Is it the same? Probably not, right? Rolex, I think, is positioned here. It's elitist, it's pride, it's status, it's effort, it's, it's efficiency. That's where Rolex is. So while Louis Vuitton is extravagance and creativity, a Rolex is more for status and efficiency. And if you like bats like me, Heston's is a very, very good brand. They look like this, very normal, but they're really, really well-made, all natural materials, all handmade. And they're obviously more there, right? They're with trust, home, nature, and nostalgia. So you can position every brand within the limbic system. But here comes the trick. We learned about the mass. How many planets do you have? And the same is true for the emotions. The more complete this map is, the stronger the pull. So if you can create a brand, let's say a fashion brand that stands for rebellion, but also for the exact opposite, for quality, which is the opposite of rebellion, and for extravagance, but also for the exact opposite, which is nature and nostalgia, you have an awesome fashion brand. And if those things are true for fashion, they're true for everything. And that is the emotional mass. The trick is to make both sides happy. That is how you power your success. So to wrap it up, we are all paleo at heart. We want love and love your customers and give them reasons to love you back. Our decisions are not rational. And the highest level of our non-national story-driven, emotion-driven decision is experience. The full body experiences are offline. The direct experiences are offline. That's why brands create big, big offline experiences in flagship stores like the Starbucks Roastery or the Johnny Walker experience in Edinburgh for $150 million. Or now you might have read that Old Spice in Columbus is now actually creating barber shops. These are offline experiences. But what the flagship stores do now is they add another layer of online. For instance, the Old Spice store doubles as a fully functioning studio to produce digital and social media content in real time. They have stars, musicians, everything. So online adds reach to the old experience. Online helps you walk faster, run further, get places better. And it actually adds also another experience, which is data-driven services. So finally, what you need to do is you need to create an experience universe, no matter if you're a brand or if you're LMU. And in this universe, you have to think about the pull of experiences, the pull of those experiences, both emotionally and sexually create your attention, your attraction. This is what the most important thing of experiences is. Thank you very much. This was the fourth one. Next time we talk about nature, but now I will stop sharing my screen and open the discussion. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dietmar. That was so engaging and great and really thought provoking. Um, just as a friendly reminder to all of our attendees, please do uh, type in your questions in the Q&A. And thank you for those of you who are typing in questions. I do have a question for Dietmar and our faculty have questions too. So um, I was just wondering, you know, post pandemic, perhaps, uh, do you see a growth in partnerships with different brands um, in order to provide experiences? And in addition to that, do you know of, of two brands that have been successful that have come together to provide an awesome experience for their customers? 
I think a very easy one to make it really down to earth and super uh, hands on is uh, if you cooperate as a restaurant with uh, services like uh, Uber Eats and stuff like that, delivery services. Mm -hmm. I think the actual uh, the the link between your business, which is an offline business and the customer who is an offline customer, that link has to be online. And I think the smart move is to understand that the online, if online is not your 40, if you're not really, really strong online, get a partner who can. We are always working in teams, in corporations, and we just have to have the best fulfillment possible. So I think that is a uh, clear clear yes and cooperating with new services even lmu cooperating with zoom is a very very smart move and that is everywhere if you do not cooperate it is very likely that you will die in times like these great um, before we go into the q a andy i know you had a question i didn't know if you wanted to ask or I i'm happy to ask for you i'm your on mute love sure um i'll ask it thank you um, let me find. <laughs> uh, so, Dimar, thank you again and again and again. Do you think there are certain industries or product categories that work best in delivering this like extraordinary offline experience? Uh, no, because uh, I think it is not an industry or product thing. I think it's really down to the management. Does the management understand that experience is the biggest driver? And does the management then put the money where uh, the, the, the mouth is? If you look at the Johnny Walker experience, which is one building for 150 million, you know, not every brand does that. And I really, really wonder how come there's not enough, uh, as you will see in the handouts, uh, uh, centers where you have awesome experiences. I think if you, look at regular experiences like the m m store in new york and stuff you can mm -hmm. find that there's also kind of pull of experiences for kids stuff like toys r us used to have especially in new york the fairy ferris wheel and stuff like that but i think this is peanuts the big stuff is to say my brand the soul of my brand is the experience and sorry to say that but more or less let's build a temple for this experience let's really build a serious flagship store you see many, many uh, companies moving into flagship stores. Many brands are moving into flagship stores, but still it's just a fraction of all the brands that there are. So I think every brand can do it. Mm -hmm. I, th I would like to see a flagship store for car tires, for instance. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dietmar. Thank you for that, Andy. Um, we do have a question here from Brandon. Thank you for your question, Brandon. Um, hey, Dean Mara, and thanks for another engaging presentation. Are you familiar with NFTs, non-fungible tokens? Yeah. And if Absolutely. so, have you created your own? Uh, I'm actually a shareholder of a company which is also mentioned in the, in the handout. This, share, this company is called Fuse. And what it is, it's a, you can buy into the fame or uh of stars right we signed for instance in los angeles uh pat malone we're in contact i think even with billy eilish we have little yadi and stuff like that and what those stars do is via an nft and oh by the way uh, let me just explain what an nft is a regular token uh, a fungible token is a token uh it's like a dollar bill. Every dollar bill is the, is the exact same other dollar bill. I can take Andy's $20 bill and I can give him two tens and it's the same thing. A non-fungible token is more like a piece of art, like a Basquiat or something, right? It's, it's very, very unique. And what happens with non-fungible tokens is that you can put a unique experience on the blockchain. And it is, you cannot copy this. It cannot be copied like the Basquiat. If you were to copy it, you would forge it. It cannot be copied because it's on the blockchain, but you can sell it, you can own it, you can trade it. And I think this is an amazing uh, opportunity for brands and for people to create unique experiences that you can trade on the blockchain. Even if, and that's the kicker, the thing in reality then is uh, offline. For instance, what we did or what we are trying to do now with Fuse is there's one artist who just smashed his guitar on stage. 
So we made an NFT of the pieces of the smashed guitar. So the pieces of the guitar are unique and you can actually get them on the blockchain and they will always say that you own them. So the answer is yes, NFTs are very, very uh, big. It's definitely something that you should uh, dive into a little bit more. There's one short page in the new handout that you uh, will receive at the end of everything about it. Wonderful, thank you. And thank you for whoever asked this question. You talked about amazing brands offer a wide range of emotional experiences. However, some brands succeed by honing in one voice and message. How should brands um, balance between appealing to everyone and appealing to a targeted group of customers? What a great question. Uh, I think what is, what's happening is that you are a certain kind of, like let's say a, a brand is a, like a person, right? And uh, you don't want to be everybody's darling because then you're nothing, but you should stand for something. But the interesting thing is that you, even if you stand for something, you might treat different people differently. I treat a kid differently from, a, from an adult. I treat uh, somebody who's uh, in, in trouble differently from somebody who's not in trouble. I'm even different when I'm at a soccer game from when I'm, uh, I don't know, at, uh, at a sad event or when I'm like a funeral or when I'm uh, in, in a business meeting. So my personality, I as a brand, I stay the same, but still I react completely differently with individuals. And that's why I think the unique selling proposition should not be a uniform selling proposition. If you are the same all the time, constantly, you start to get boring, you even start to get annoying. Just imagine I were to, uh, to talk to you always, hi, my name is Dietmar, what can I get you? Boom, and that's the only thing I do. You think, my God, that's a soulless robot. So if you want to create soul, if you want to create stories, if you want to create experiences, be true to yourself, but create a variety and an individualization of those experiences. Awesome. Um, thank you, Izzy, for your question. Um, how can a brand that's already established, that's already established themselves one way, take advantage of the concepts you're talking about to modernize themselves without dismissing their roots? Uh, the trick is to be, the, the question is what a root is and what dismissing those roots are. I would argue that a brand is a little bit more, I don't know how those like a snake or whatever that get rid of the skin. So you actually build a new skin and you get rid of the old one. You have to develop yourself. For instance, can you say that Apple, for instance, as an established brand, when they killed uh, the, the um, I think iPod it was called, and I think they even killed iTunes and stuff like that. Do they get rid of their roots? No, they, tr they are true to themselves, but they develop, they go one step further. If you climb up a ladder, all those ladder, ladder rungs, I think it's called, those little steps, if you go on, on the one up, the one below, you're leaving the one below. You needed the one below to get to the one up. So the thing is to evolve and leave the past behind. The past make you what you are anyway, but be new. That's what I would advise a brand like that. Wonderful, thank you for that. And um, before I go into our next set of questions, I just wanted to reshare my screen for those of you who are looking for CBA Advantage points. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and put up our QR code. I hope you all can see that. If you have trouble seeing it, just let me know on the chat. Um, so Thomas, thank you so much for asking this question. Uh, how do companies come back from controversy, like the ones of executives using, um, saying things around racial or LGBT issues? I think the most important thing is A, to acknowledge those things. Don't uh, not acknowledge them. Look the problems in the eye, admit that you were wrong, and then come up with an action plan. Say, commit yourself to making the wrong right, and measure your success. The last time I showed you how to measure those success by saying, 
uh, I either did something good or not, and you write it down every day. It's also in the handout. Be that as it may, just excusing yourself and f saying your story without action is hollow, and it will be with it will be noticed by the customers. So what you need to do is you have to acknowledge the problem. You have to come up with a plan on how to behave correctly. How would you like to, what would you like to do instead? And then you need to do it every single day. It's very simple, but that's what you need to do. Fantastic. And uh, one last question from Cassandra. Hello, Cassandra. What can you imagine as a future mashup in social cause meets product? Oh, heavy. Uh, we were talking about things like uh, the milk that I'm drinking. Uh, and the, the, the milk is that you, you just put your, your phone to the milk and then it, it tells you all those kinds of things. Be that there's various ways you can exit those kinds of information. It can be a QR code. It can be an NFT chip. It can be what's called quantum dots. You can even do things where the people look at the structure and stuff like that. And those things are getting easier and easier and easier and more and more native to the phone. So what happens is that you're creating a new level of augmented reality, an augmented reality that is not just visual, but that is heavily uh, just like information driven, like the, the milk example I just showed. And I think that brands have now the opportunity to tell longer stories, to tell deeper stories, and to engage way more with their customer through digital means, especially on pack, on the product, actually where they are. I still think this is a, I think this is a great service, but I think this is just uh, the small step service. I still think that in order to create the entire universe, you have to have the small things on product, where you actually talk about sustainability, for instance, that's the next talk anyway. And then you have to have big celebration events where you actually dedicate an entire event or an, an entire experience, an entire house to this particular thing. So I think that for instance, Patagonia is doing it totally right by uh, putting the old clothes in the actual stores and say, this is the same thing. And really, really driving, um, the world of uh, recycling, for instance, heavily. They really put their action where their mouth is. And I think that brands can really, really learn from this. The, the connection between sustainability and brands will be, is very important and it will be growing and will be even more important in the future. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dietmar. We're out of time and I appreciate everyone who stayed on for a little bit longer. Dietmar, again, thank you for such an awesome thought provoking presentation. Definitely, you know, giving us some insights and things to look forward to and to really change just how we do things. So thank you for that. And thank you for all of our attendees who've attended today. Dietmar will be back with us next week, same time, same place. Um, under LMU Business Insights tonight, we also have 98, our very own alumni-led startup, um, who'll be talking about their experience. Uh, we're also super excited to launch um, a leadership in the C-suite hosted by our very own Dean Dale Smith and our very first speaker, will be William Hornbuckle. He's the CEO and president of MGM Resource International and that's scheduled for next Wednesday, March 17th. Hope you all can join us. And, uh, but you know, for now, thank you. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we will see you all next week. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.